I have to tell you that I am absolutely shocked that there are this many people here this evening who want to study about a dead heretic. <laughs> this, this is amazing. And there are a number of students here from the, my classes, all of whom will get A's, of course. I told them that in chapel the other day. If they don't come, they don't get an A. So I threatened them, Brother Pope Joy. I remember the first meeting in this building. Brother Hearn was preaching here then. That would have been 51 years ago. I came the particular Sunday to investigate the school at Knight Arnold. And Brother Hearn preached all day and then took the time that evening to show me everything. And I was impressed by that and uh, made the decision to come to the Memphis School of Preaching. No, that was not 1863, Tom. That was, that was 1973. But well, we're glad to be here tonight. What an interesting study. Uh, everything we're talking about has led to all the problems we have in terms of religion and the study of religion. Julius Wellhausen. Ich bin ein Deutscher. And so was he, a German. Let's talk a little bit tonight about Julius Wellhausen. And this information should help all of the students to understand modernistic tendencies and the direction of the mindset of these people. He developed a theory, Wellhausen did, of a non-inspired Bible. When he started out to study theology, he became very confused about certain Old Testament statements and he attempted to find the answers from a Dr. Groff. And he and Groff together are known as the groff wellhausen theory of inspiration. But his literary historical approach to the scriptures, he thought would solve all the supposed difficulties that he found in the Old Testament. He wrote this, I became a theologian because a scientific treatment of the Bible interested me. Only gradually did I come to understand that a professor of theology also has the practical task of preparing students for service in the Protestant church, and that I am not adequate to this practical task, but that instead, despite all caution on my own part, I make my hearers unfit for their office. It would almost be like coming to the Memphis School of Preaching and hearing a teacher say he didn't believe the Bible was God's word. And that's what he discovered about himself. He was supposed to be teaching theology students when he himself did not believe what he was saying. And so he wrote, since then my theological professorship has been weighing heavily on my conscience. I have to admire at least he had a conscience and realized that he did not believe that the Bible was God's word, and he realized that very early on in his studies. Wellhausen moved several times as he changed his teaching duties and eventually started teaching subjects other than theology. He's best known for his prologamana, excuse me, prologamana zur Geschichte Israel, and, he, and you have it there in English, and his contributions to a basic documentary hypothesis, which of course is a denial of the verbal inspiration of scripture. If you have an Old Testament with you tonight, I invite your attention to 2 Samuel 23, 2, where David wrote, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. That's inspiration. God used the very vocabulary that David had in order to write the words that God wanted written. What a great definition of inspiration. Wellhausen did not believe this. And when you study Wellhausen and his theories, you have to keep in mind something. You have to be very careful to understand that he was trying to secularize the Bible. Every effort he made was in that area. He was focused especially on Genesis through Joshua and his efforts and his work done always in those areas. 
We have before us something called the documentary hypothesis. I don't have time tonight to do all of that. I will in, uh, do a little bit of it a little later, but that's not entirely Wellhausen's work, but his contributions to it uh, were such that it expanded it into an area where many theologians could say, well, Dr. Wellhausen believes it, and so I'm going to accept it. I know personally that historical critical approaches to the Bible are believed and taught in several of our graduate schools. I sat in the classes. I heard them teach what Wellhausen was teaching. When you think about God's word, brothers and sisters, simply and logically, this has to be a book from a higher mind than man's. If you're going to decide who wrote this book, just ask yourself, was he good men or bad men or lunatics? Because those are the only three groups you have, logically. And if you take the position that good men wrote it without any help from God, you have a serious problem in logic. Because each one of them said, the word of the Lord came to me saying. They all claimed that God spoke to them. Well, if they did that without God speaking to them, they were liars and not good men by definition. Well, you think bad men wrote it? Yeah, that's your other position. Well, they have written a book that condemns their badness? I don't think so. Bad men don't do that. Lunatics didn't write it. The book's too logical, too uh, in-depth in terms of its geography and science and so on. I have no choice but logically to understand, since good men didn't write it by themselves and bad men didn't write it to condemn themselves, and lunatics certainly didn't put it together, I have to understand somebody else had this book written. I was thinking on the way down here tonight, again, and it always stuns me, how did all of this start? You should think that all the time. Because either logically you believe in an eternal mind or eternal dirt. That's it. And for the life of me, I cannot bring myself to think that dirt developed an eternal mind. Wellhausen, on the other hand, tried to secularize everything about Scripture. This man was born in Hummeline, Germany, in the kingdom of Hanover. He was born in 1844 in the month of May. He, does, he died at the age of 73 in 1918, January 7th. Wellhausen's father was a Lutheran clergyman, and so he was in a family that believed certain things. He became a student of theology at the University of Göttingen and studied under a man named Jörg A. Heinrich, August Ewald, a conservative Protestant teacher. You can still read some of Ewald's works in most libraries if you pick up some uh, of the, his books, you'll see what he was writing and so on. And at Göttingen, after he graduated, Wellhausen became a professor of Old Testament history. But he moved then to the University of Griesewald, where he was a professor of theology and began to think about what he was teaching his students, as I've already noted for you. That quote I gave you of his was from a letter that he wrote to the president of Griesewald and at that time, at the age of 28, Wellhausen resigned from his work as a theological professor at that university. He could no longer teach theology. He got a job then as a professor of Oriental languages at the University of Halle, but then he moved to the University of Marburg in 1885 and then transferred back to the University of Göttingen and it said Göttingen where he stayed until his death, and it was at that university where he did most of his work on trying to prove that the Bible is nothing more than a man's history book. He is best known for the prolegomena, 
but Wellhausen wrote 10 other books. And so we have a lot of his material. We can understand what he was teaching. J.W. McGarvey knew about Wellhausen. And he wrote about Wellhausen. And Wellhausen had read a review by two men of his prolegomena. <laughs> And the two reviewers struck at his evolutionary theory of how the Bible came about. There's your word now, evolutionary theory of how the Bible came to be. Wellhausen wrote about those two reviewers. They can count on a number of readers who hate me. What a pity that I live in an age in which I can no longer be burned at the stake. When you're studying or reading about someone who has a very high IQ, you have to be ready to understand he knows what you're saying. He just doesn't believe it. And so he's not, we're not talking about somebody that's a dumb fellow here that didn't know what he was talking about. He knew what he was talking about. He knew exactly what he was doing. And he knew why those two men did not care for him. McGarvey wrote to Wellhausen and then put it in, in his book, McGarvey did, that the note that Wellhausen sent clearly showed that the review had struck him <laughs> in a very, <laughs> Uh, tender spot. And then he added, Brother McGarvey did, his reply is the old cry of every man who, by false teaching, excites the disgust of earnest men. I'm so glad J. Brother McGarvey lived among us. He too was an intellectual and a, a very intelligent uh, gentleman. Wellhausen advanced the theory of the documentary hypothesis. And his theory remained the dominant model for Pentateuch studies until the last 25 years of the 20th century. And if you were to go to a graduate school today, you would not study the documentary hypothesis anymore. In fact, our professors, some of them, get away with the thought, well, I don't believe that. What they don't tell you is they're foreign critics. And that's where they've gone. What's a form critic? Well, you see this book is not actual history. What we have to do is figure out the form of the text and see if we can relate it to some period in history. And then we'll have to read between the lines to figure out what it actually says. There lived in the first part of the 20th century, he died in 1963, a man named Rudolf Bullmann. And Bullmann taught his students what is known in theological circles as the Bultmannian secret. Did you know what happened, Tom? The apostles saw him walk out of that tomb and they thought, boy, we better make up some stories about him. So that's what your New Testament is. And the only time it becomes the Word of God, Brother Trey, is when you pick it up and it says something that relates to your life. That's why you hear these people on television talk about, God laid a word on my heart today. That's where all that nonsense comes from. The historical critical approach to Scripture. Because this isn't the Word of God until it says something to you personally then it becomes God's word. That is Wellhausen's legacy and men like him that you're studying this week. At the end of the last century, Wellhausen's theory was that only four authors wrote the Bible, that only four. But modern theologians began to add editors to the authors. And now the form critic has a multiplicity of authors, maybe in the same chapter. And so when you're studying on one of these professors, you need to ask him, now, uh, who wrote this verse? I l was six years old when the Japanese surrendered. I was five years old when the Germans surrendered. 
I had no knowledge of the Holocaust. I didn't know that was taking place. But Wellhausen has been blamed for his te from his teaching for what happened to the Jews. Why? Wellhausen decided that the Jewish people were not the chosen people of God and that he decided, according to those who are his critics, to destroy the Jewish religion. He so was so confused about the Old Testament, he, he just was so disgusted by it in his confusion that he intended, they said, in his writings to destroy the Jewish religion. It is the case that Hitler was very familiar with Wellhausen's writings. And that may be only con coincidental, but certainly the Jewish people were hated in Germany. And that's the legacy of a Julius Wellhausen. He was a huge historian, a word merchant, a linguist, a textual critic. And his name will be forever associated with higher criticism, which is destructive criticism. He will be associated with a purely scientific and critical approach to the Bible that is not involved at all in inspiration from God. Wellhausen kept up with his first teacher, Mr. Ewald, and eventually the two of them had a falling out over Wellhausen's approach. But it's interesting that that University of Göttingen, even though they didn't agree with him, still granted him a PhD. Higher education is only about money, folks. <laughs> That's what it's about. If you get a doctor's degree, if you've got a dollar fifty-seven, you can still get a cup of coffee. But you get a doctor's degree and you start denying what this is, you might as well throw that thing away. And I watched several of my fellow students do that very thing. And that's exactly what Wellhausen did. He got too smart for the Bible. Let me take you through quickly as I can his view of the law of Moses. This is Wellhausen and the Law of Moses. For 2,000 years, every Jewish rabbi taught what I teach, that the Law of Moses preceded the prophets, and that the prophets who preached from the 9th to the 5th centuries BC were calling the people back to the Law of Moses. I don't know who turned in that cold air, but it's right on my head. And there are icicles forming on the back of my ears. Could somebody turn that off, please? Is it off? It will be. Oh, oh, you did it on your phone? <laughs> That's an elder, too. Isn't that one of their qualifications, not to touch that phone? <laughs> Wellhausen decided that the Mosaic Code was written after the time of the prophets. That's the D part of his theory. And that wasn't written until the sixth century. This misunderstanding by Wellhausen concerning Moses and the prophets began in a paper he wrote for you all when Wellhausen was still a student of his. The standard work in universities at that time on the chronology of the law and the prophets was A.W. Noble's work. Noble's views are correct, I still teach them, the Law of Moses, of course, preceded the prophetic work. But here's how Wellhausen learned what he began to believe about the Law of Moses being post-prophetic work. He said, at, listen to this now, at last in the course of a casual visit to Göttingen in the summer of 1867, I learned through ritual that Karl Heinrich Groff placed the law later than the prophets, and almost without knowing his reasons for the hypothesis, I was prepared to accept it. I readily acknowledged to myself the possibility of understanding Hebrew antiquity without the Torah. This theory is known today as the groff Wellhausen theory of higher criticism. 
I've always been grateful that these heretics show up when they do. Because for 2,000 years, people thought the Law of Moses was written first. Aren't you glad these guys showed up so late in history that they would know differently? We got guys running around the Brotherhood t saying strange things all the time. You students, before you take a position, check with the Brotherhood. They've gotten it right for 200 years. We got enough new stuff running around now. I think Wellhaus must have come out of his tomb or something. Something's going on out here. The question was, was the Law of Moses in existence before or after the prophetic writings. If you try to put the prophetic writings first, you have to reverse the logic of cause and effect. Because you put the effect before the cause. You can't do that logically. Wellhausen was illogical. He was confused. But the result of his error is things still taught in graduate school. Isn't that amazing? You have a confused logician. Well, he wasn't even a logician. And so, who wrote the Old Testament law, brother, or Mr. Velhausen? Ezra did. Moses didn't really exist, you know. Just a character Ezra made. And when did he write that law, Moses, Mr. Velhausen? In 440 B, 444 B.C. Let me take just a minute, and I'll go through this as quickly as I can. I'm as bored with this as you probably are. <laughs> Let's talk about that documentary hypothesis for just a moment. The first book of the Hexateuch was Deuteronomy, according to Wellhausen. And that book wasn't found until Josiah, Hilkiah found it and gave it to Josiah. And that would be 650 BC. And so he first dated Deuteronomy at 650 B.C. The documentary hypothesis also contains the concept that the other five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Joshua, were not written until after the captivity or exile in Babylon. If you go to a graduate school, students, and you hear a professor use the words, sits in Liebem, run. That's German for the situation in life. That's higher critical approach to scripture. That says that the community developed that thought, not God. It evolved through the community. It didn't come from God. And it took all those centuries for all that good teaching to evolve and so it couldn't have possibly been done by Moses. And then Wilhausen began to read some texts had the word Yahweh in them. It's translated Jehovah in the American Standard. It's really a mistranslation, but it's there in the American Standard. Jehovah. And then some of the texts had Elohim in them. So you have, must have two different authors. So he called the one the J author and the other, the E author. So now he had J-E-D for his theory. He had some people writing a who were writing as followers of Jehovah, others following Elohim. That's the same being if I read the scriptures correctly. And during the Babylonian captivity, again, according to this theory, the laws now found in the Pentateuch were composed by a group of priests over there in Babylonian captivity. And so that's the P part of the D part that's part of the J and the E part. Now comes Wellhausen with his contribution. He found a little editor. And so he had a JEDP editor little one he added in there. Why would there be people interested in a Deuteronomy text? Well, in Wellhausen's thinking, they were interested in maintaining Torah. When I was taking this kind of material under Dr. Turner down at Alabama School of Religion, Brother Turner would tell us these things and then say to us, what do you think? 
and I had to wake up, of course. This is about as interesting to me when I'm talking about something that I know isn't true. You know what my opinion about these form critics is today? The ones who say there are a whole lot of authors, not just JEDP? I think what they are are wolves in JEDP clothing, exactly what they are. They are false teachers. In McCollum's work, The Evangelical Imperatives, he sets out five points about these critics, Wellhausen and others. I want to tell them to you here, it's in the book, but I agree with what he's saying here about these fellows. He says they have argued that there are inconsistencies in the text with the genealogies and the numbers. And so they view that as evidence of one or more than one writer. When I was in the United States Navy, back before dirt was invented, the United States Navy sent me to Adak, Alaska without Dorothy, and I was there a long time. And I wrote her every day, and I think she could have argued, must have been more than one author. Because I got this subject in this letter, and over here he said something different from what he said over here, so that must be an inconsistency. Got to be two authors. That's this theory. That's where they're going with it. And so the critics said, they view this evidence as, as there's more than one writer. Anytime the text is repeated, got to be more than one writer. McCollum pointed that out. So they criticize any repetition of the text. Oh, some of my second year students would have trouble in their preaching because they repeat themselves often when they're preaching. Must be more than one preacher up there. Any difference in style of writing is seen as evidence for more than one author rather than a difference in the topic being discussed. That's still going on, Tom. Difference in style must be more than one author. Another error or source of their thinking for literary critics is they think the Bible text should never discontinue at any point, even if the history changed. But their biggest error is that they have presupposed that the prophets could have not known the law of Moses, and so they must late date the law of Moses. What we have here is just evolutionary theory applied to the scriptures. That's modernism. At the graduate school where I attended, they gave us a book to study by J. Sidlow Baxter. That book is Introduction to the Old Testament. In that book, he takes the view that since the community thought of this material they had as God's word and they developed it, since they uh, treated it as if it were God's word, that's how we're going to approach the Bible. We're going to treat it as if it is God's word. That's evolutionary theory. The Bible was developed over the centuries through the community as they added to it and various authors put it in and others edited it and so on. This is an anti-God, anti-inspiration, anti-truth view and we have a serious problem in our country today, and you students of scripture need to understand this. You're living in a time when you have no way to argue with these fellows. It used to be in theological circles that there was some logic, and you could question and get some discussion going. But today, there is no dialogue available to us because they are not reasoning anymore. And so you cannot reason with people who don't reason. They don't allow for a dialogue. Why? Because the only God to them is the one they experience. Listen to their theory. This is modernism. This is a quote directly from the, one of their, this is McCollum. The only way we understand anything is by symbols. Culture creates language, and language is our only means to understand reality. Uh, Brother Rick, incidentally, have you decided whether you're a male or a female yet? You have? And you think that's reality? 
There is no reality. That's the point. I live in a time when there's no reality. I have nothing then I can argue. The, anything I say to him is not real. I'm all right, you're all right. The two gods in America today is how long can I live and how much money can I make? The postmodernist says, no culture is wrong in what is real to it, for all truth is relative. I want to read to you what Wellhausen said about the battle at the Red Sea. This is the time when the Israelites were pinned between the Egyptian army and the Red Sea. And when McGarvey read this, Brother McGarvey said, Fellhausen can make and unmake history at will. Here's what he said. Here's Fellhausen. He's writing about the event at the Red Sea. The situation was a critical one. But a high wind during the night had left the shallow sea so low that it became possible to ford it. In the movie on this, that's exactly what they did, is waded through the water. That's not true. The Bible tells us they went across on dry ground. But he said, so low that it became possible to ford it. Moses accepted the venture and led the people across. <laughs> Moses saw some of them going, so he decided he'd go with them. The Egyptians rushing after came up with them on the further shore, and a battle ensued. But the Egyptians fought at a disadvantage, the ground being ill-suited for their chariots and horsemen. They fell into confusion and attempted to retreat. Meanwhile, the wind changed. The waters returned and the pursuers were annihilated. Professor I had said that the wind dried up that reed sea so they could cross on it, so I raised my hand. Yes, I said, would you tell me how those Egyptians drowned in that mud? That's the same professor that said that for Elisha to go out in a chariot five miles into space is ridiculous. He'd freeze to death out there. I started laughing. <laughs> Buddy Bankhead was sitting next to me. Buddy said, why are you laughing? I said, now I know why that chair was on fire. <laughs> I don't want you young people going to a graduate school until you're ready. Don't you dare do that. You get ready because they're going to throw stuff at you you wouldn't believe. Well, I hope you don't believe it. But. What is source criticism? That the Bible writers used sources for their material. Sometimes they did, but it was under God's direction. Wellhausen's new author, his editor, he called E2. So his theory is J-E-P-D-E-2. His theories are popular because evolution is the thought theory of the day. But source criticism replaced his theories in the 1970s. And as I've already told you, the form critic is at the place today where the JEPD people used to be. Uh, I understand there's a student at the Texas School of Preaching named Hubbard. Would you raise your hand, please? This isn't about your mom that I'm about to do. But I'm going to have Wellhausen examine the poem, Old Mother Hubbard, for us. Let's see how he did. Okay? Here's what he would have done to it. Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to get her poor dog a bone. But when she got there, the cupboard was bare. And so the poor dog got none. Will Wellhausen would have wondered if there was one or two writers, because no one could tell you when she got to the cupboard. Must be two authors. He would also have speculated that the story was just a legend and not true. Then he would have tried to figure out if the term mother would mean it was an actual account, but who could really tell? Besides, an editor probably composed the poem from two different sources. 
since a venerable mother is represented by one author and a poor dog by another. Did this event happen every time the dog was hungry? So the literary critic would want to know, and maybe she kept the dog poor by not laying away something in the cupboard in the first place. She probably was mean-spirited and stingy and just pretended that the cupboard was bare. Well, thank you, Mr. Wellhausen, for spoiling my poem. Who are the authors of this Old Mother Hubbard? Well, there was Goose A and Goose B. And he would probably have decided that some editor had claimed that Mother Goose wrote the poem, and Wellhausen would have probably announced that literary criticism had now proved that the poem had been written by separate authors and it was full of inconsistencies. I ran across something rather accidentally, I think, when I was reading Brother McGarvey, and it startled me. He wrote this. This is on page 312 of his work. It's a historical fact that when literary critics, watch this, are shown copies of their own decades old material on which they worked with an associate, the critic can't tell which was his and which was the associate's. And also these historical critics disagree among themselves on how many authors there are, how many editors there are, and so on. And so there is no absolute truth here. Brother McGarvey wrote, a Mr. Dana and a Mr. Grisham, historical critics, were asked to analyze a letter from President Cleveland as to whether he or his Secretary of State wrote it. Dana argued for President Cleveland, Grisham for the Secretary of State. Now if you take a so what attitude toward what you're hearing this week, I hope you'll change it. If you're going to try to ignore these fellows, I hope you'll quit ignoring them. Because if Moses did not write the books with his name, then the entire Bible is a lie. That's right. Jesus and the apostles did not tell the truth when they said a certain prophet wrote a certain thing. In fact, Jesus answered the Pharisees of his day with Matthew, uh, with uh, Genesis, did he not? Matthew 19, 6. But these fellows have a theory about that. If you study general building introduction of the Memphis School of Preaching, you're going to be studying something called the accommodation theory. Do you know what that is? That says that Jesus knew that Moses didn't really write that. But since the people to whom he was talking wrote it, he accommodated his teaching to their unbelief. In other words, the master's a liar. This is why we call these fellows destructive critics. Brother Keeble used to say over and over again, the Bible's right. But here you have a man who was frustrated because he couldn't understand the Old Testament text. It didn't match his existing denominationalism. And he got confused. And rather than find the truth, he became hateful of the Bible itself. His father was a Lutheran pastor. But Wellhausen's name, Julius Wellhausen, will be forever associated with attempts to destroy God's word. And Wellhausen said, the prophets must have written before the law of Moses, otherwise I can't figure it out. Must have been some other authors and editors. And I want to leave you with the Greek answer to Wellhausen's theory. How many of you know Greek? You don't know Greek? Well, this is a Greek word, and it's the answer to his theory. Hogwash. <laughs> that may be a Texas word. Yes. What I want to know is, how
how can I maintain my balance with all of this stuff going on all the time? I need to have my feet planted somewhere, like a tree planted by a river of water. I know something, and I've known it for a long time. This book I have here is a product of the mind of Almighty God. No doubt in my mind about that. I've spent 30 years of my life researching this material, even wrote a book on the subject, the book Godbury, wrote three books, they put it in one. Why did I write that material? Because of what I was hearing at the graduate school. And what I knew that people who went there would hear. But I want to tell you something about this book. There are no errors in it. It's not inconsistent. And it's actually laid out according to our salvation. <laughs> Matthew and Mark were written to cause faith in the minds of the people of the day. Luke was written to cause repentance in the minds of every man. John was written to talk to us about the deity of Christ, which we must confess. And in the book of Acts, we can read about baptisms. There you got it. Faith, repentance, confession, baptism. You got 21 letters telling you how to live the life because it's harder to get there than it, or to stay there than it is to get there. And then at the end, we get to go home to a place called heaven. Little boy was reading a book and he was talking to it. He said, no, you won't. No, that's not going to happen. His father got really disturbed. Little boy talking to a book. He said, what are you doing? He said, I'm reading a book about policemen and robbers. And these robbers keep thinking they're going to win. But I read the end of the book, and I know they're not. So I tell them, no, you're not. The devil keeps thinking he's going to win, but I read the end of the book, and he's not going to do it. I hope you read the end of the book, too. If this is not God's word, I want you to tell me how we're going to get to heaven. You realize that these kind of theories take away man's hope? They do. They rob us of our hope. They rob us of truth. Judith Fellhausen. <clears throat> lost his soul. If you're here tonight and you don't know my Lord, you're going to lose yours. He is the Christ. He is deity. The evidence is overwhelmingly strong as to who he is. And he said, the scripture cannot be broken, John 10, 35. I hope you'll obey him if you have not. He just asked you two things. Confess his deity before witnesses. And he wants you to be immersed in water. And as you come up out of that grave, he will take away all your past sins. His Father will place you into Christ and in the church. Baptism is in order to that situation. But that requires that you make the decision to do those two things. That's called repentance. And maybe there are some here tonight that have had some doubts about this book. You don't need to. The evidence is there. All we need to do is examine it. But if you have a need tonight while we're led in song, will you come while we stand, while we sing? Carry the soul.